wanted to also take this opportunity to thank not only Clara, but also um, all of the staff at MOCA for facilitating not just this exhibition, but also creating the space for this conversation to unfold. Um, so as Clara said, um, you know, the, the origins of this are a conversation that we had a few months ago um, that was um, really stimulated by a call from October Magazine, and I wanted to continue this conversation um, about diaspora and modernity and begin this afternoon's conversation by reading a short passage. This is a passage from um, the powerful conclusion of a novel uh, in Thai called Pisat um, that was published in 1957 by the author Seni Sawapong. Um, in this passage, the protagonist, um, Sai Sima, um, is speaking, and uh, he's a man of humble origins who in the novel becomes a lawyer through the educational reforms that were brought about after the end of the absolute monarchy in 1932. So before 1932, education was the privilege of the aristocracy. Common people couldn't um, pursue higher ed. And after 1932, that changes. Um, so in the novel, he's invited to, the, to dinner at the home of his girlfriend, um, who was a fellow student, but from an aristocratic background. And at the dinner, he's humiliated by the other guests. So he's leaving. Um, so it begins, uh, if no one has anything more to say, I'll take my leave. He marked a pause and then went on. Before I go, I'd like to waste a little of your precious time in order to state a few facts. Only a little, because when someone like me speaks, nobody indeed cares to listen. But for once, whether you want to listen or not, you'll have to. I'm delighted that you've all had the opportunity to know me, thanks to the kindness of our host who invited me. Indeed, I'm one of the invited guests, the only crow among swans. His lordship invited me for a certain purpose. Therefore, it isn't the fault of this particular brazen crow that it finds itself among a flock of swans tonight because it did not impose itself on the present company but was duly invited. I'm extremely proud today that I was born the son of a farmer or the son of a peasant. Um, I don't know why my father was not an aristocrat, but there are many more peasants than aristocrats and my father belongs to the majority. I therefore have no reason to feel ashamed that I didn't happen to be born in some aristocratic family of ancient lineage because aristocracy is a condition that we ourselves created and chose to uphold. That situation won't last as time, which never stands still, would change it irresistibly. Indeed, differences in eras and times give us conflicting views. I'm not an intruder on those of you who live in lofty ivory towers, but when you spit your mucus to the ground from your towers, I have to wipe it off because it's refuse. There's no need to harm you, however, because no matter what, you must disappear in time. You won't be able to resist the changes brought about by time. Sooner or later, all the old things will be confined to museums one after the other. You misunderstand if you think that I'm trying to pass myself off as an aristocrat, that I want to be one of you, because that would be going backwards. Much time has elapsed already, and your world and mine are getting further apart. I am the ghost that time has fashioned to scare those who live in the old world, to give nightmares to those who hold to the old ways of thinking, and nothing can comfort you, just as nothing can stop the march of time, which will produce more and more ghosts like me. You thought you could destroy this particular ghost tonight amid such exalted company, but there's no way this can happen, because this ghost is even more invulnerable than Achilles or Siegfried, as he is protected by the shield of time. You may hold on to a few scraps for a while, but you won't be able to control everything forever. We are worlds apart. Mine is the world of ordinary people. He slightly bowed his head when he had finished talking and left the dinner table, stepped outside and down the stairs, walked along the driveway through the main gate and out in the street, out of a world in which he had no inclination to linger and which had no wish to see him stay. So I'm sharing this as a kind of elaborate detour um, in the hopes that you will read this as a writer reads it, that is, as a critical reader. And to read it not just for how the author produces a particular emotional affect, but to read beyond that affect and look at how the author perceives both the world around them and how they are, as an author, implicated in that world. So um, this novel, Pisat, which you can maybe translate as um, Ghosts or Queer Beast um, was published in 1957, uh, which is the same year that uh, another military coup in Thailand ushered in a period in which the country became 
a staging ground for U.S. imperialism in Southeast Asia. Um, the monarchy returned to political prominence. Les Majest laws were broadened, and critical knowledge and cultural production, like the author of Sainis, was repressed. So I'm giving you this very brief background to also ask you to question that naive and optimistic heroism of the protagonist's words. And instead of looking at this as a kind of very brave statement about the inevitability of democracy, um, look instead at the ways that the author is bending our understanding of time. And in bending time, he's also asking us to consider modernity and its promises at this critical point in history. And these are the same promises that allowed the narrator to ascend class society, but he's reached a kind of impasse, right? He's reached a kind of failure of that promise. And this ghost from the future shows a cool regard for the figures of the past that torment him. So he doesn't want to kill them, um, but instead he says that it's inevitable that they're going to be interred in the museums as exhibits to study or perhaps to admire. And we should remember that the museum is an institution that developed coeval with imperialism and its forms of knowledge production. Um, as Benedict Anderson has famously pointed out, it was a technology of nation and empire building and was one of the tools through which the colonial state imagined the legitimacy of its ancestry. And in it, the accumulation of acts of world making were reduced to art. So if you think of what the Benin bronzes meant to the kings of Benin and their subjects, and what they mean today locked away in the British Museum, that these are two very different things, or indeed any of the images that have been looted from Encore and sold through the black market into American and European museums, that these are things, these are uh, objects of world making that have been cut off from the populations, the rituals, the, uh, the cultures that sustain them and imbued them with a life force beyond that of the market. So I wanted to ask what does it mean that Sai, the protagonist of Bisat, who I just read you um, his words, wants to put his tormentors, the beneficiaries of this imperial project, in the museums that they've introduced? And I thought of this weird specter of the future, the promise that haunts a modernity that's still conditioned by the past, where the power structures of the past continue to inform what we consider as possible. And in particular, what the namesake of Paul's retrospective prologue to the story of the birth of freedom means that this moment of ontological exodus. So in this piece by Paul, which you can see just through that door, the prologue of Hollywood's cartoonish retelling of the book of Exodus becomes this never ending prolegomon, this never ending um, prologue, or a glitch for us to consider, like Sai, the protagonist of Bisat, the failure of modernity in delivering its promises, and maybe, maybe even the failure of a teleological view of history that has become too accustomed to the tidy compartmentalization of time into past, present, and future. So I wanted to kick things off and bring Paul and Julie into the conversation um, by thinking about the ways that both of your work really bends time or engages with this more complicated structure of time than a teleological history of modernism allows, meaning that you know, there's classical past, there's uh, a medieval period in between where the light gets turned off, then there's the Renaissance, someone turns the light on and magically we have knowledge, and then we proceed through to, to modernity, right? This very kind of like clear delineation of how we've gotten to this point. So I wanted to ask for Paul, you know, for me that kind of, that, um, that technique that he uses again and again, the loop, really, which he uses in prologue to the story of the birth of freedom, um, really speaks against that kind of clear teleological ordering of, of history. And so I wanted to maybe begin by asking you about your attachment to the loop and also, Julie, the ways that in your paintings, time is kind of layered in a way that the layers are not distinct and isolated from each other, but that they interact with one another. So. Um, wow, thank you for that. <laughs> um, yeah, in short, I, well, I feel like I have to, we were just talking before entering, uh, uh, coming on this stage, and once again, just in dialogue with you guys, uh, it made, it just generated new ideas, and so I, I feel like I have to, like, reorder kind of what we, because in response to your question, I was 
thinking about a question that Julie just asked in the kitchen upstairs uh, about um, like how these images or these works come to be. Um, there's a sense that they're, uh, it's hard to imagine them like artworks being fully premeditated. Um, in a way they come more out of some kind of space of unknowing um, and so how that works, like how, you know, going from some kind of intuition or vision to something of, that takes material form, like the loop, like how that happens. And the word that you then uh, used a little bit later was ne neologism, um, which I would define as like this process where you take two existing words and you put them together to create a new word. And the reason why you would do that is because there is no existing word that fully satisfies the expression that you're trying to, or the vision that you're trying to articulate. So uh, like I would begin the answer about the loop and I'm uh, in, by remembering that in, in, in a way, the discovery of the loop for myself came as a direct response to experiencing software for editing digital video uh, in the late 90s at a time when um, it wasn't yet on the consumer market. Um, it was more a professional tool and um, I was of the generation that was on the cusp and, and one of my first jobs after grad, grad school was to teach Photoshop at Parsons School of Design. Um, Ed Noriega, who was the director of the Digital Foundation Program, um, which is being rolled out in basically all colleges across the US. Um, I remember him telling me when he interviewed me for the job, he was like, you know, if you could just read the manuals and stay one week ahead of the students, then you're gonna be good. And that was literally what it was, which is to say, nobody was an expert. You know, we were all kind of being introduced to these new tools, which we now take for granted, uh, simultaneously, young and old, uh, and, and in a way it was sheer discovery in the late 90s and early 2000s. And so the most kind of basic movement that is endemic to something like Premiere or uh, After Effects is to just scrub back and forth. Um, it, it makes sense to me that, you know, in the full flowering of this medium, uh, the loop becomes the uh, format of delivery of everything from the meme to the news to every kind of information. Everything now comes to us as a loop. I have more to say about the loop, but just for now to say that, like I'm really intrigued in what, uh, what you guys also think about this like process of coming to form in a condition of unknowing uh, through something like neologism of like, basically by working with the material, it kind of, its own nature um, reveals itself to you as kind of the limits of possibility of what can be expressed in, in the medium. Absolutely. Um, I, I think like uh, the same for me in terms of the layering. The ca it really comes from this place of unknowing um, and, and investigation into trying to find some form or mine some form of framework for what I was working with at the time with these with, with just these marks that were kind of existing in this space of this no place and in order to give it some kind of space that um, could ha somehow be critical in a different sense I, I, I started to use very kind of intuitively the architectural language but it wasn't layering the architectural language with a particular, like a, a form, a known form or agenda. It was really through the process of making and, and working with this material that I started to study that language. And then through the study, was able to then create these visual neologisms with the kind of layering of this architecture to create some kind of other um, morphed 
kind of fused different type of space where the the hyenas <laughs> where the the entire the, the this whole this whole language could then something else could be possible and one of the so for me in term, in terms of time like there is in the moment that you that we pass through that where there is this theological sense of time we are, we are living in a collapsed in the, in a kind of collapsed space time continuum constantly like we're in the past in the future and we're and we're kind of trying to navigate this all simultaneously and so that was something that became like that started to happen in the paintings before i even really even understood how that could be um, how how potent that space was what I also, what, something that I want to talk about with the neologism, though, is that in painting, at least, and I think, I think, you know, I was, as you were talking, Paul, I was thinking, there's so many new forms of technologies that it's so interesting to me that you were using, you were, the, you were uh, in the 90s, you were using this technology at the front of, like, ahead of the curve, in a way. And there's so many new, like, green screen technologies and all kinds of ways to create um, alternative worlds, but what's hap what ha happens more and more is you're using f um, kind of a, you're going you're using this older technology to then mine these new structures of hyper realities that we're in, or these kind of mirrored realities that we're engaged in, um, and it's not it's not like trying to find this trying to mine technology. It's not about the technology itself. It's exposing this other social, t you know, infrastructure or, techno or, or, you know, kind of um, technology. So to me, that's, that just came up, like, when you were just talking about that, that I found really interesting that you go to, you know, the, in the most recent piece, is that red, blue, green? The most uh, recent red, piece? green, blue. Red, green, blue, sorry. Red, Same green, difference. But the, you're using this, old, you're using, you're using this, kind of, the, the technology that's used to create, that we've been watching sports for, from, from these early games that you even use in terms of that 64 game, the 64 World Cup. But it's the same technology. It's not some like hyper-invented new technology. And yet what, you, what is exposed is something that's super potent and interesting and, 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 and entangles all of us in this space of um, whatever, um, the enslaved and the kind of... Um, well, the, techno the, the kind of infrastructure of that. Like, I mean, I think, Lawrence, you can talk more about this in a second. But, like, so that to me was just an, is just an interesting aside. But I really think for artists, the space of unknowing in terms of trying to kind of invent something else and, and mine for something else, it's not a process uh, that we um, work from that, that where something is, is prescribed. Like there's really this, it's not something, it's not like we're writing, you know, something, even in writing, you're like, it's an investigation. Yeah. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a searching. And in your work, the, that the earliest video that we see, or the, some of the earliest pieces, like Fragment of a Crucifixion, all the way through to the, to the, to the fighters. When were those made? The, the ones with the prison monitors, I forgot the titles. Oh, just, just this year. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I mean, the kind of, the, what happens in that space of erasure is just incredible. And so I just, I'm really interested in what happens where, where you have an idea of how to approach something, but what really happens in the making of the piece, it's not something you could foresee. And the visceral kind of experience of, of what so many pieces in the show, it is that space, it's in that space of unknowing that something else is achieved. And that's what's, I think, really remarkable about this show is the kind of continu continuum that we see over 25 years of how that process keeps exposing these tropes to us. It, it's it, it's really interesting what the both of you are saying, and I you know I think like you know we should acknowledge that 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 terrain of the unknown is like you know that that space that you know where where creativity unfolds, right? Right. But what I think is so you know you know interesting about the ways that you work that space in the both of your work is that you you retain a certain amount of the unknown. That it's not like oh I figured I figured out the problem here's here's the answer, but it's like you you maintain that field in the work itself. Um, I'll, I'll unpack that a little more, but I also wanted to you know one of the other things that occurred to me when Paul was describing those early years of of working at Parsons, um, you know how it really it's not unfamiliar what you're describing. I think anyone that teaches like knows that yeah you're just you know, like a week ahead of your students if you're on top of things. 
but that you know for many many years um, particularly in like with artists that were working with new forms of technology like in the 80s and I was thinking of like Shuli Chang's work um, that you know art became this form of research and development for tech companies for advertising where like the companies had a kind of like commercial vision or a, a commercial objective for the things that they were making but didn't know where it could go beyond that, how one could further exploit those technologies. Mm -hmm. And so they were very happy to like, you know, throw a little bit of money at artists, you know, give them access to a little bit of technology and hope that it would create a new path, you know, for them to continue developing these things. But what I find so interesting is that both of you have sort of maybe, um, you know, you, you take something from those techniques, right? So I think in your paintings, for example, the ways, you know, the early paintings, how um, you're using architectural drawings, but in a way that, you know, really challenges architects to like rethink how the drawing is not just a communication of how one should build a space and you give it to the builders and they make it, you know, real and tactile. Mm. But a way of just, you know, really like reconsidering how, um, how space is constructed, how other, other kinds of spaces are folded into like material, tactile, Euclidean space. But it, it, it makes me also think about the ways that in Paul's work, there's this, um, there's this, you know, you, you take many of the techniques, the technologies of modernity, um, and for me, particularly architectural modernities, like, um, perspective, the museum, the stadium, um, and you go somewhere else with it, right? That you're not just sort of presenting these things, repeating these things as hermetically sealed images, but in a way that makes clear the terms of their fabrication. Um, so I think of like the stadium, which is something that, you know, occurs again and again in your work. You know, the stadium, like the museum, was this architectural typology that was associated with 20th century uh, mass politics and the imagined community of the nation state, right? That if you think of, um, you know, some of the, um, the beginning of the 20th century, this kind of like race to, you know, continue to create a bigger and bigger stadium that could incorporate more and more um, viewers, that this was really an opportunity where the, the members of this imagined community of the nation state could really get a tactile sense of what that, that fictive unity of national belonging really felt like, right? Like it's one thing to say, you're an American and you have some affinity with someone on the other coast of this like, you know, monstrously large country. But it's another thing to say like, oh, we're all in like the same space, right? Like we can all see each other, you know, you know and in the stadium you see each other through, through the spectacle. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that in, in your work, you present the image but also the apparatus, right? That, right. Um, so some of your early sculptures, like the Pure Products Go Crazy, John 316, Live Evil, and then more recently, um, Red, Blue, Green. Red, Red, Green, Blue. Red, Green, Blue. <laughs> why do I want to, why do we want to say Red, Blue, Green? Red, Green, Blue. <laughs> really emphasize the apparatus of the spectacle, you know, and you can really see that clearly in my favorite room in the exhibition, um, which is how the Saints is presented, right? Where, you know, you, you experience the spectacle but that experience has been delaminated, meaning the layers have been separated into these composite parts, right? So you, you enter the room and you're like, wow, what the hell? And then see like the focus of your attention is this tiny monitor, which is hilarious, right? And so, you know, you approach it, you're kind of chuckling to yourself and then you go around the corner and see actually like how all of these other effects are produced. And then suddenly emotionally, it's like the whole thing becomes really quite moving. Um, so I was, I was really thinking how, you know, by making that apparatus like visible to us, like in these, you know, in these pieces, it's not any less moving, right? It's, it's maybe even more moving because you can see how these, you know, how that effect is produced. Um, Comments? Is that fair? Yeah, it is. And, but but it's, it's also like, the, like it go, again, like when you talk about the apparatus, like the exposure of the apparatus, and what happened, like even though it's a 20th century kind of 
that you're exposing this project from the of that of that you know the the the, the space of spectacle and propaganda there's this other kind of ancient aspect that's embedded in that which is the slave as the as the kind of protagonist in of in, at the center of the spectacle going back to the Colosseum and way before and to me that's another space that I would love to hear you talk about because I feel that that's really the power also of red, green, blue, and, and so much of the work is exposing, again, that same construct, no matter how, and, and the icon, like the kind of eradication of the icon by the erasure of all of their iconography. Like, you, you, there's this other, you're exposing something else, and, and, it's a, and like we, we just were saying, 25 years of this, this insistence on that, so. I mean, and, yeah, I, I have like too many thoughts <laughs> that, but I, uh, in some ways I, I, I like that both the techniques of the visual or the spectacle you're talking about and at the same time uh, something about erasure or what's, what remains invisible Mm -hmm. is being implicated as almost like two sides of the same coin or something. That there's always, you know, it almost seems like for something to become visible, something else has to become invisible. Um, that's a principle that I find super intriguing um, for different reasons. Um, and definitely as my own experience of working with material, I would say generally, like I think of myself, I think of my favorite kind of making is kind of in the process of being an editor, um, which seems like immaterial because like you're playing with images that don't necessarily have a substrate um, like a painting does, but it is material nonetheless and kind of has a way of moving or not moving in its own ways that you can't just do whatever you want, but you sort of learn how it wants to be shaped and then work with that. Mm. Um, so one dimension uh, that comes to mind of what you're saying um, has to do with the relationship between uh, the image and the armature. Um, I remember at one point just uh, thinking about um, the sculptures of the elongated figures of um, Giacometti, yeah. And uh, it occurred to me at some point, I think I was going through, like it was a, a, a kind of a survey of all of Giacometti's work that was at the Tate maybe or someplace, and, uh, and I realized that although there are these elongated figures that are like a signature of Giacometti. There's always something else. The, the figure is kind of installed on a set of wheels, like the figure is on a vehicle preparing to move around or is on a kind of platform or within a frame that almost looks like a TV. Mm. Um, in every case, the figure is never just a figure but um, has a kind of like stage or backdrop which serves as a kind of armature uh, in relation to which the figure appears. And in some ways, I think of this relationship as fundamental. There is always an armature that allows the thing to appear and it always appears to the eye as a kind of object with its own agency, uh, whether it's an object on the table or whether the object is an individual, mm -hmm. like an individual identity. But, you know, n no object can appear independently of a kind of environment um, out of which it emerges. And yet, that background largely, somehow in our human perception, remains invisible. And in a way, that is what makes it the background. Um, it, it, it is, you know, everything that has to become invisible in order for the object to yeah. appear in the foreground. 
And as an editor, I would just say that like, when you edit an image in After Effects, um, the background has as much value as the foreground. Um, you pick it apart, you know, you manipulate both the background and the foreground uh, frame by frame potentially, so that then when the image is done and it's played in real time, uh, it produces potentially uncanny effects because you can no longer see what was the manipulation that was happening in the background as well as the foreground. You just see that somehow the natural order of background and foreground has been reversed or has been complicated uh, in a way that the eye in its uh, kind of automatic um, wiring can't uh, process. Mm. Um, yeah. No, it's it's really interesting, and I, I think what you're saying connects a lot of things that I'm going to try and unpack. But like, so you know what you say about the agency of objects, I think certainly resonates with you know what Julie was saying about making you know the the labor conditions of like you know of of that that object visible, yeah. right? You know, and so if you think of you know the history of um, you know of um, the history of slavery in this country is the history of like you know objects like struggling to like articulate some kind of agency whether successfully or not um, but I also was thinking you know when the two of you were talking about it's very seldom that someone really speaks to like you know the the attention to craft in both of your work you know and I think of like a certain kind of like you know attention to craft that is about like you shouldn't see the traces of that labor, right? Like a really beautiful chair, you know, or like, you know, a really, you know, well put together building should exhibit like, it should look effortless. It should, you know, not show any traces of the labor that built it. And I feel like in both of your work, there's an attempt to make visible that labor or the conditions of that labor. But I think what I was trying to get at with talking about, you know, making, you know, the background, you know, complicating that relationship to background and foreground, is that the viewer itself, the person that's experiencing the work, is also somehow implicated in that. So that one comes away with, there's no such thing as a kind of passive viewer in the way that there's no such thing as a kind of innocence, right? That you, mm -hmm. you know, whether you're, you know, directly involved in the material conditions of you know, of, of production or not, you're still, you know, your, your hands are still dirty. You're still a part of this larger system that has like, you know, produced the object. Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, yeah. there was a, at the end of the um, kind of short biography that um, Clara read, um, there was a reference, if I'm not mistaken, to something about um, human behavior. Um, I just found it intriguing, you know, to think of like a, ba a of a painting as, in some ways, tracking evolutions in human behavior. <laughs> um, because, in some ways, I think, you know, like once again, we think of the painting as. Uh, the thing on the stretcher uh, uh, within the four corners of the canvas, but then in an expanded sense, to me, you know, uh, painting uh, only appears with the kind of uh, immense choreography of the white wall and um, the white cube and the entrance to the white cube um, and the lighting, mm -hmm. and in a way the invisible or visible cues telling the viewer how to enter the room, how mm -hmm. to approach the canvas, and, and in a way all of these things are being choreographed and framed, um, but they uh, are effective because they're more or less invisible, and yet um, they're fundamental to the experience. Absolutely. So in that sense, the object is just a kind of like decoy for a play 
on like setting up a condition of or an experience um, for viewers in a public space um, that that ultimately to me speaks to like uh, a larger awareness of conventions of viewing and and um, of kind of you know social agreements about like how we behave like in 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 different kinds of spaces mm. um, how we socialize and, and um, in a way to me art like absolutely interacts with these codes on every level um, and, and and so it, it always goes far beyond the object um, I mean to me this is extremely evident because you know I feel like the spaces that uh, like I attempt to occupy occupy as an artist in some ways are really meant for um, a notion of art that's much more related to uh, to a painting or to a sculpture than to a video. <laughs> and so from the very beginning, you know, it was uh, a very like per, uh, foregrounded question. Um, I remember in 1998, um, when I had the first opportunity to show and potentially uh, have an art patron uh, collect one of my works, uh, the immediate question was like, you know, what is this work? Is it the video that will be on a file on a DVD or uh, later on, you know? What is the thing? Or is it this peculiar armature that sticks out of the wall. It was literally like my first gallerist asked me, which is it gonna be? <laughs> um, and I think I made the right choice. I said, it, it's the video has to come with this armature and it can't be shown on any other kind of armature or yeah. monitor or projector. And that literally determined everything for the last 25 years. Um, but you know, in, in some ways, ultimately, it's just—it's interesting to me to think that you know, to produce things that have effects uh, in the world of contemporary art is to engage like a lot of invisible systems um, that remain invisible and and that allow like the simple object to appear kind of circulating in our social realm um, for others to kind of experience. Um, ultimately, I do think, and to me, I think the further we get into the 21st century, the more clear this becomes that uh, to play with images and objects is absolutely a matter of choreographing on the level of human behavior. Absolutely. It's interesting because I've been just did the show in London where the the paintings actually stand in the space and they're these transparent they're translucent to some degree they're not fully transparent but the blur become you know to talk about the ghost again the blur from of a photograph it it's like once the photograph is blurred and abstracted you can't really understand what that photograph is in terms of its illegibility but I mean, there's this definite illegibility, but there's a, a visceral kind of experience that happens that is captured in the light, the colors, and whatever exists in that, that, that then become the kind of ghosts of that image. And then there are these shadows that, are, that appear in the paintings because of the way that they're lit and the way that an individual then engages with them. Scale is also another thing. You play with scale in terms of reducing this image so much, and I play with scale in terms of expanding that to implicate the, to implicate the viewer as well. But then within that, what, what became interesting to me in this space and this play with this choreography is if you can make the paintings translucent, the shadow, the, when people move through the space, their bodies become part of the painting and the painting, the image is something that you can't capture fully because it's constantly mutating, constantly evolving with the activation of not just you as the viewer, but others who aren't even necessarily aware of you viewing them through the painting. So it becomes this space to, you know, in, in, in push that, even investigate that also further. So to go back again to this idea 
like the the Stanley Cup, the kind of the 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 the, the immensity the, of that the scale of that cup without all the team, without the team there who who are ecstatic to have it and kissing it and passing it around. You just have this kind of floating um, prize in that way. It, it would be like like go ahead. No, no, I, <laughs> it's I, like such an amazing piece. I, and, I wanted to go back to what you were talking about erasure and for, yeah. for me like you talking about the shadows which I think are also a part of yeah. you know or you the know, boxers you sense your, you sense the fighters work. I, I was thinking you know so on the one hand for me you know your work very consciously adapts like all these kind of um, techniques or like um, you know uh, aesthetic cues of modernity yeah. right like like erasure, right? There's this kind of like cleanliness that I think like, you know, cleanliness to the image that I think we associate with modernism in your work. But I think there's another aspect to your work which has really gone unremarked upon and that is its affinity with the Baroque. So for architecture, the Baroque is this kind of like, you know, really short period that everyone wants to forget about because <laughs> it's like this moment after the Renaissance that doesn't make sense because suddenly like instead of going from like you know clean classicism to neoclassicism to the modern you have this moment of just like excess you know everything is like overdone and we have to remember that the Baroque really emerges in a particular time and place which is 16th century um, Europe the Catholic Church is you know embarked on the counter-reformation is trying to counter um, you know, um, Protestantism and trying to, you know, win back believers by, you know, creating these like churches in which if you follow us, this is, this is what you'll get at the end of the line. This is what heaven is really like. We're trying to persuade you that like <laughs> heaven is this like amazing place just by entering churches like Il Jesu. And these architects make use of techniques like quadratura in which they're blending that you know, they're, they're blending media, right? They're, they're taking from sculpture, or painting, architecture, and mm. creating this multi-media experience. But they're also, you, you know, like you look at the, the mural on the ceiling of, of Il Jesu and you can see like so much of it is like partly in shadows, those tricks where you're like, wow, I'm like really, you know, I can actually touch like heaven. I can like reach up to God, you know, and like the angels are like flying around me that those effects are accomplished through like these kind of like totally. techniques of like blurring and shading and like leaving certain things like still in that mysterious period. So I was just, I don't know, maybe a way of asking like, yeah, I mean, you what's were, the place of the Baroque? I, I felt like in your question when we rehearsed this, you were also... <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're playing jazz here, this is totally improvised. Um, this, the, the Baroque was also something that you associated with the word propaganda. Um, I, you know, that, that kind of like touchability or like, in a way kind of like the immersiveness of, of, of the aesthetic. Well, you know, you can really look at the Baroque as that period in which art moves from, you know, being about, at least in the hands of the wealthy, like an object that one can you know, and, and remember this is like early in the definition of what art is, right? That it's moving from like just this thing that's like beautiful and gives me pleasure and I'll put in my home, you know, to like, it's really meant to convey a message. It's, it's really a form of propaganda, but sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, that's, to me it's clear uh, uh, that that idea of a kind of multi-sensory or multimedia um, kind of approach to creative making um, that it uh, it immediately calls to mind the kinds of immersive experiences that we have now. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Social media. <laughs> so it's kind of it's funny to think uh, of the Baroque as kind of this like really really old, you know, totally. almost like forgotten attempt to like create what we've now uh, like found much more potent tools to achieve. Um, but it also makes me think of, you know, immediately like this idea of a connection to propaganda makes me think about obviously film. Um, 
as you know, another kind of um, past experiment, social experiment in the production of images for uh, propagandistic purposes. Um, and you know, as much as we think of film generally as a form of entertainment and you know, like in a way wanting to please the audience, so like how much harm could it be doing? Um, you know, of course, like, you know, historically it's, I mean, and it is like the model for the, the achievement of like perfection in, uh, in, in uh, like being able to like produce convincing and immersive messages. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, in some ways like all the more reason to like think about the relationship between the image and the ar and the armature, or to think about like kind of what's um, rendered invisible. But Paul, talk about that more because like um, when you think about when we talk about erasure, for for me, erasure kind of became this important space in painting to allow for this almost third space to emerge, or what maybe Moten talks about with the break, like the potency of what can happen in this space of like these fissures that where you know we don't have the language for everything that's there but there are these fissures where something else can can something else potent can be activated or yeah. or emerge and and the way that you use erasure to i feel like is 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 really interesting as this as this form of like also camouflage or exposure to something else and and it's and it's like been a consistent thread. So I, it would be like just talk about that a little more. Yeah, I mean, in a way, to me, you know, the what's really at stake in a conversation like this, and what I've always felt is really at the heart of our conversation for decades now is like a, a kind of a desire um, that I would characterize as, you know, wanting to articulate something that I think we intuit as a shared experience mm. that struggles to combat kind of received or like inherited uh, stories or structures that we're meant to live in. Right. Uh, like we've inherited a world out of a certain kind of experience we intuit the way the world really is. And there's a gap between what we envision or what we intuit and what we're told is reality. Um, there's just, and I don't, you know, I don't think it's, I'm not trying to boil it down to a formula, but I find it interesting that all three of us were born or raised um, at, uh, important moments outside the United States. Um, and so, you know, I, I've always felt like we have a shared view that has to do with a kind of um, formative experience of seeing the world from two different locations. Or, or from, more. Or more, yeah. And so like what's produced out of that in some ways I can't help but think of as being, you know, a kind of like uh, experienced uh, like um, uh, an experience that then you know conditions like how we see things in the world or even how we navigate the world and I don't think we're unique at all I think this is like a condition that's it's extremely common and yet it does defy a certain set of conventions that we inherit that tell us about who we are as members of nation states. Um, and, and, and so I think, you know, I, I think that we are involved in a shared kind of work to elaborate, you know, to create neologisms that can speak to this intuition. Yeah. Um, and in a way that is the kind of product of the story of the birth of freedom is like a very long euphemism for exodus. And, um, in particular, uh, ontological exodus, as opposed to, you know, the notion of like the exodus as just being a geographic movement from one place to another, 
Um, I, I love the idea of the exodus as potentially being a, a, an imaginative movement um, where you're moving from one system of thought into a new system of thought that is being uh, just being born. Uh, and also to think of that exodus as not like a, just a vehicle, you know, delivering, you know, the formerly land. enslaved people to like the promised land of the nation state. But that is the exodus itself. The exodus itself is the condition. You know, I think that's what's meant by these kind of murmurings in the wilderness. Is that you know, yeah. this is this is the moment that we occupy. And it's not going to clarify by like, you know, going to the other side of the nation state. Um, Can I? But yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I, I'm going to try not to go off, but like I just, I do think, yeah, just as far as erasure goes, I just want to put on the table. I also think that, and because, you know, you've invoked the slave yeah. um, or, or hidden labor. Um, I mean, to me, you know, there's, there's something that all... Like that, that's always there, and yet most of the time unspoken, um, which has to do with foreground background, which is just the idea that, you know, part of the formation of any system is that it, it needs to disavow or uh, to repress aspects of its formation uh, that are inconvenient or a little bit like grubby and um, dirty and like we don't want to talk about like the dirty laundry. <laughs> like in a way, you know, you get to the banquet table by like not showing the dirty laundry and yet we all know that the dirty laundry is, you know, intrinsic to how we get there. I happened to hear, hear this speech that um, Andrea Fraser gave um, recently, and she says, um, uh, "Honor is always haunted by the ghost of dishonor, <laughs> yeah. because we all secretly know." everything we've done in order to achieve the otter. <laughs> but we're not going to talk about it. So in a way, like, you know, the, the thing that I, I, in a way that I think about in relation to playing with texts like the 1966 World Cup or a football game or the Stanley Cup, um, in some ways I think of these as... Uh, things that are related to, they're like triumph narratives. And in a way, because of it, they, they relate to the nation state. Like the nation state is just simply about achieving, you know, having achieved uh, a certain kind of like, you know, arrival in the world um, as individuals and as, as a people. And, and yet, you know, uh, modernity in this sense is always haunted by uh, what it's not going to talk about, like the dirty laundry that um, was necessary to make it to arrive. Mm. Um, right. And so in a way, like materially speaking, to kind of um, play with material to like bring out the ghosts that are in the material um, by, by just, you know, uh, um, by playing with the foreground and background. Um, in a way, is a material expression of something bigger, a, a bigger form of repression that uh, is always present. Right. Well, it's, you know, it's those ghosts of, you know, that promise that never arrives, right? Yes, it's, you know, exactly. in, in the text that I read at the beginning of our conversation, it's, it's that ghost of the future that is never going to get here. You know, like, yeah, you're, you're sorry, you're never going to be free. <laughs> but... You know, it, 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 what you're saying also, you know, resonates with me that, you know, a, another commonality that the three of us share is a kind of like, you know, early engagement with, you know, a form of, um, a form of activism that was really about, 
addressing an erasure that I think we all experienced in our education, right? Like, well, where, where are the other people of color? Where are the other queer people of color in this narrative about modernity? Where are, like, you know, where are, where are all of the, you know, the hands that actually, like, enabled Europe to, like, you know, achieve, like, industrialization and, like, you know, produce, produce modernity? Um, and I think that, you know, that there's that, that kind of activism was really based on this kind of insistence of, you know, well, in, in the face of that erasure, in the face of the absence, to say, I am here. I am here, damn it, I am here. And I think the three of us were maybe played with that at early periods. Like, I think of some of the work that you did, like mm. the, the Santo Nino made of, like, you know, like... Transparent like, glass. No, made of like condoms. Like this oh. is like early, early like you know <laughs> work that I think like you probably like to disown, but <laughs> but like but you know to me like you know what what the work says now is like to take that very simple formulation of I am here, and to begin to question well like you know what is what does I mean and what does here mean as opposed to like this trying to insert oneself into this like narrative that is already corrupt into a world that is already, you know, fucked up. Mm. Um, it goes you know, back so, to Exodus too, I mean, yeah. the burning bush. And, yeah, well, and, I mean, to and, think of like, yeah. you know, to tie this back to what I was saying before yeah. about, you know, what that Fred Moten has brought up, you know, in like um, that chapter on Hester Scream about, you know, the object does have, you know, you can argue with Marx that the object does have a certain agency, right? That the history of black people, um, you know, in the diaspora is the history of objects, like, trying to assert their agency, right? But then... Not even trying, like, it's, it, it, is a, it is a condition of being, like, it is emergent. But, but what, what is missing, you know, what, what also needs to be unpacked is that, you know, Usually when we think of that struggle to assert one's agency that it resolves in like, okay, I'm no longer an object, I'm a human being, and I'm, you know, yeah. and what makes me a human being is that I'm a citizen of a nation state, right? right? This is what empowers me. As opposed to, you know, what I feel like happens with like your, your use of erasure is to like linger in that space of erasure more and use that to like, you know, really ask these like deeper, more complex ontological questions of like, well, wh what, do you, what do you mean by human exactly? And at exactly. what cost was that humanity yeah. produced if exactly. it still like does not encompass like, you know, other forms of life? Yeah. And I, sorry, sorry just to like, um, you know, like bring this to an end to think also of like, you know, um, yeah, actually, never mind, I forgot. What were you going to say? You sure? <laughs> yeah. I'll remember. But. Um, no, I was just thinking, uh, just to, there was a question that came up when I, we all have certain, like, off and on, have this thing about uh, studying different texts, like uh, novels um, and essays that, that um, in an extended way, have an aspect that relates to the story of Exodus. Hmm. And, and I, I remember one of, the, um, one of the books that we read together was um, uh, Moses, Man of the Mountain, um, Zora Neale Hurston. And um, in that particular retelling, one of the things that is really foregrounded is the sense of um, a kind of like ambivalence that Moses has about playing the leader at all with this group of people, you know, who need to be liberated. And to boil it down to a question, which actually I remember um, Fred Moten articulating, you know, like uh, the, the reticence of Moses uh, is articulated when Moses says in Zora Neale Hurston's novel, like, I'm gonna liberate these people and they're gonna end up reproducing the same conditions that we're leaving. So there's always this question in, you know, in attempting to innovate and move to the next place, like to what extent are we reproducing the same pattern in a new form um, in a way that will end up just reinscribing the limitation or, or the, the problem in the first place, like how, 
yeah, it's a problem of imagination. And I, in some ways, I think, for example, to think of it as uh, in, a, in a timeline as something that, say, from the past to the present, you know, there was this promise of modernity that has failed. Mm -hmm. And so we want to imagine in the future overcoming the failure to achieve the promise. Um, this in itself reproduces a linear time structure. And so uh, with all the best intentions, um, we try with our might, you know, to just simply like practice like, you know, the gift of imagination um, to move us collectively to a better place. Uh, and because of a kind of like, just, you know, an assumption that the kind of, the background is a constant and so, you know, we just act against the background. We inadvertently reproduce the pattern. And the pattern is nothing more than just a linear sense of time. Um, mm. It's this kind of almost like uh, a faded, uh, mistaken belief in the promise itself as like a future-oriented goal uh, when in fact possibly, you know, the notion, the notion of uh, temporal linearity, past, present, future, is like the illusion itself. Mm -hmm. Like it's, that is the limitation and that we should be thinking about change in a state of simultaneity. Yeah. Remember we were talking about, you know, yeah, I, I, I can think of other examples, but in some ways like the real kind of imaginative puzzle is to like acknowledge that the only ways that we can think collectively are with inherited language. And yet the inherited language is also the problem. Yeah. So like how do we produce meaningfully the neologism when on some level the neologism will be a kind of carryover of the DNA of the inherited words. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested when you said like we're doing jazz, you know, of the role of um, something like uh, the, the art of improvisation in what we're talking about. You know, like neologism to me is like something that comes up almost like an intuition like jazz. In the moment. Yeah, absolutely, and then also, you know, going back to this inherited, we're both, we're all, we all come from a generation where the, where the promise of modernity was the emergent kind of logic that we were all promised, this kind of idea of democracy, liberation, and, and some form of, of other possibility that we've wa witnessed the co-option of, whether in the United States with the kind of um, Reagan years and the kind of turning back on on the, the active promise of the Civil Rights Act and what came out of the, of the end of Jim Crow, whether it was on the continent of Africa with the kind of decolonial project that completely became co-opted and, and emerged, like devolved into like the dystopic 80s of like extra height and neocolonialism and kind of its own monster inside there or in, on, on, in Asia as well. And so you have, or the entire global south, you have this kind of, we, we came of that time where that and we've talked. We talk about this a lot because being these agents from elsewhere and kind of constantly living inside that break. But I, I, I keep going back to this place where poetics and art offer this space where something else is possible. And when the failures of our imagination, um, the failures of the language that we have in our imagine in the in the, in the space of we don't have, we can't imagine a different way of being. Like when we question the nation state, when we question, when we see this happening all over the world at this moment, we, the, the you know, it's, it's in the space of, it's in the space of what we're, what we can create where something else might be possible, where the imaginatory kind of emancipatory space is like really kind of potent. And a big part of that is in this space of using intuition honing the sense of intuition, unknowing, and um, invention, I mean, real, like to, to allow for this other thing, and uh, this other emergent kind of space. Um, but we've, we've, talked about, we've talked about that a lot, and I think Denison Hill is another version of that. Like, we started this idea, we, 
all worked up there, hap, you know, just by chance. And then we decided to create this thing that we didn't know what we wanted it to be. But it became this. It's been something, I, I don't know how many years we've been doing it now, like almost 20. And it's this something that has, has slowly been something that we, the three of us have crafted and tried to manipulate and change. And that with other agents, with other people at times, with um, an amazing new leadership. But we're really trying to, like, we, we don't really know what it is exactly what we're trying to do, but it's this space, it's the porch, it's this, it's in this, it's in this, in this place of unknowing that we, we, we're really trying to bring people together to like invent something else and to, and to have these conversations, whether that's in the book group or, or elsewhere. I wouldn't go so far as to say that we don't know what we're doing, but I think that we know. You know the I mean, way in it, certain ways we do, but but like. the way I think the way that we've treated <laughs> Deniston Hill as a kind of project has been, you know, in many ways to go back to this, like, you know, to think of like, you know, but, these firms, these forms of world making that precede exactly. art making in the world, and that like, well, your responsibility is to like that land, that that land, and space. using this indigenous form of knowledge. These, Mining these other indigenous forms of knowledge for some other well, kind of studying arrival. them, learning yeah, from them. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, also, you know, to also take seriously what it means to be a custodian of, like, exactly. You know, of of the earth. But I, you know, but going back to the background and foreground and the surround in that space, right? Is where is this exactly. space that we're really kind of immersed in working? Right, and, but it's not and, just a white. Canvas, exactly, but. and like the the reason the neologism keeps coming up is. Mark making has people have been doing this for for millennia. It's not it's not a new thing to make marks, and there isn't a mark you can make that hasn't been made. So, the space that the the active space in that or the the space of agency is in the possibility of the recombination of marks with this new form of making. Like a handprint has been something that has been m being made for decades and decades, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years. Whereas, but. A David Hammond's handprint is very different from a Nauman handprint that's different from a John's hand, handprint that's different from my handprint, and then how they interact with other marks becomes something else. And it's in that space where the inhuman and the human can do something else, like where this other space, this other thing can be invented. And I think that's what happens in your editing, where that's what, the, and what you're exposing in terms of exposing this constant the apparatus, like if we can go back to that a little bit more in terms of, because every, even the way that this show is created architecturally is the apparatus of a sound space or a sound stage or a theater of a film studio that you see the exterior, you see the infrastructure, it's exposed and then you in, in, enter the piece and you enter this other space, this ontological space. Can you like, Go further with that. I, I was actually, just, wait, let me, because I, I just remembered <laughs> what I was going to say, and I think me. it's maybe like a good bridge for you, but, you know, to go back to like, you know, that idea of like the kind of, you know, Lord. 1980s, like, you know, activism around like identity that yeah. I think we're all like, you know, in, embroiled in or on the cut, you know, at the edges of, that I think that there's, um, there's a kind of activism that I think is still really prevalent in the world that is based on like a kind of like moral appeal. Yeah. And I think that increasingly, you know, what we see is that, you know, more important than this politics of morality, because in fact, morality is pretty straightforward, you know, like don't fucking kill someone, don't, you know, don't lie, don't, you know, don't cheat. Um, is, isn't, is a politics of, ont of ontology, right? And that is like a much more difficult thing yeah. to consider, right? Well, what, what does it actually mean to be human and at whose expense is that, you know, is that category of the human created? And I think it also speaks to what, you know, when Paul was saying, like, you know, the, the problem of the imagination, like, the problem is not the imagination, but the failure of the imagination. Yeah. And to imagine an ontology beyond the marketplace, and also to imagine a form of art beyond the marketplace in which, like, art fulfills some of those earlier world-making, you know, um, needs of gesturing towards, you know, what potential future could exist beyond the ontology of capitalism, beyond, like, us being merely productive, you know, cogs in this larger machine that produces things, objects, you know, that can then be enslaved and like, you know, sold on, um, you know, sold in a market. Um, but I think, 
you know, your, your invocation of poetry is like one way to like, you know, return to that, mm. that world making, right? That there are these, these aspects, these germs, these like fragments that still kind of like, you know, persist, you know, in spite of like that kind of like hegemonic thrust of like, you know, mm. of, of the market, that it's, it's always going to be there. Um, Which is what Coltrane talked about so much in terms of that form of invention and the, and the kind of knowledge of, of being human. Um, or what, when you go back to Anne Hester's scream again with Moton, it's, the, it's the same kind of this invention of something else right. that's coming from exactly that condition, despite every intention to extinguish. And I think, you know, it, it also speaks to a kind of like, to go back to your idea of simultaneity, like when, when you first brought up like simultaneity yesterday, I was thinking, well, this is like, you know, Ben Anderson writes about how like, you know, simultaneity is one of the like, the key characteristics of modernism, right? That, you know, the novel as this like modern form, you know, is predicated in this like understanding of the concept of simultaneity, that while character A is doing something with character B, character C and character D are also doing something in the same period and then at a certain point like their their lives intersect or they don't but whatever it's all like the same frame but i think when you're talking about simultaneity it's really a much yeah. more complex form of simultaneity in which like no that you know that pre-modern past that pre-colonial past still exists in you know the colonial present right. and you you just have to kind of like look yeah and it's that's there. true um right i hadn't even thought of that yeah, the, the Benedict Anderson version of some of today would be like the clock. Right. Yeah. Like in modernity, we now have a clock, and that means even if 10 people in 10 different places are doing 10 different things, they're all looking at the same clock, and so in a sense, they're all on time. Modern. <laughs> yeah, like they that all is occupy very, that space of modernity. You're right. My idea of simultaneity is different. Actually, I realize what I'm thinking of as simultaneity is actually much more like the W.E.B. Du Bois term, double consciousness. Uh, it's the idea of like the ability to intuitively entertain the notion that two contradictory realities are happening at the same time and to be able to think them like I am in this world and part of this world and simultaneously this world is an illusion and I am not part of this world. To be able to think that is a form of complexity and contradiction that I think is a facility that we need to have. I think we do have and in a way, you know, but it's something that's really lacking. I mean, we see that in the kind of well, it's something that I feel like that discourse right now, or activist discourse, that is something that is continuing these past patterns in terms of the failures of that imagination. We keep going to the street, saying and yelling the same sure. things, without like really imagining or inventing or proposing a, a different type of alternative. It's these kind of repeat, repeat patterns. This, we're stuck in that loop. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I mean, to me, no, just, you know, in a way, I'm just thinking about the difference between poetry and law. You know, <laughs> like, they're both verbal expressions or, like, you know, yeah. based on uh, words. And, and yet they have very different qualities to be. You know, they, I mean, they're both malleable. Uh, you know, there's constant innovation in law as well as poetry. But I feel like, you know, the, the nature of um, law is to me more or less um, founded on a belief in rational structure. Um, and in a sense, you know, to be rational is to be transparent. Nothing's hidden, everything is accounted for. Uh, whereas in poetry, I think that, if anything, the assumption is that there's many things that are hidden and things always have more than one meaning and um, the ordering of words is meant in fact to be cryptic so that you can't consume them 
you have to read them over and over again. And in the process, your brain starts to make new connections. Like, I, I think of poetry as a form of rewiring the brain. Yeah. So, uh, in some ways, I think poetry can be done in all media. Mm. And to produce a thing that's not propaganda in the sense that it has a singular meaning that it's trying to convince or sell, um, but is, is, is actually just like a container to uh, amplify inherent contradictions within the material, let's say, mm. is a way to materially intuit or share, you know, the notion of like, uh, or an intuition of contradiction itself, uh, you know, so that the brain can remember it absolutely can deal with contradiction. Uh, and in fact, it's really enjoyable <laughs> and um, pleasurable to, you know, um, experience contradictory thought. Mm -hmm. It's actually, a, a, yeah. I, well, and yeah, and also liberatory. I mean, you know, I hear in what you're saying about living with contradictions, you know, um, you know, kind of like, you know, this sort of like elemental like idea of Buddhism, which is that, you know, you, you liber one liberates oneself, it's not from like a retreat, a full retreat from the world. Yeah. Right, by, you know, but by fully participating in an op awake way, you know, in that world, you know, and I think of like, both of your work is that kind of like, that alarm clock, you know, of like, yeah, be present, be here. Mm. But like a really gentle alarm clock. <laughs> no, <hopefully. laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, I wanted to also talk, you know, maybe to continue this discussion about, you know, the place of modernity in both of your work. And I think, you know, in Paul's work, in works like Empire, Self-Portrait as a Fountain, you know, especially figures at the base of a crucifixion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your, your, your works reference these key works in the history of, um, of postmodern modern art. Like, so for just the sake of like rhetoric, you know, I'm looking at modernity as encompassing both of those art historical categories of modernism and postmodernism. But, you know, in, in appropriating these titles, you know, I think you, you, you take them somewhere else, right? That you're, you're not just replicating, you know, self-portrait as a fountain, you know, but are asking us to, like, reconsider, like, what's behind the materiality of that. And I think also of, you know, in, in Julie's work in many ways, like, the ways that it asked us to, like, look at that kind of invisible, like, um, you know, the invisible history of colonialism in, in structuring the modern, you know, in like, um, you know, in, you know, in, in producing that kind of like, um, that, that response to like all of the features of modernity, you know, is really in many ways like, you know, enabled not just economically by, you know, by, by the colonial, by the colonial economy, but, um, you know, we, we talked about this at the last conversation and Paul very, you know, like thoughtfully, the way that Paul very thoughtfully put it was that modernism is something that's constituted in a kind of like plural, plurality, if you think of like the importance of like all of those, you know, you know, anthropological objects that were brought to Europe in the early 20th century, you know, and seen by people like Picasso, you know, that by the avant-garde, you know, and how like that stimulates like this new approach to like to the world around them, even though those things that they're looking at are like very old and come from like a completely different context, right? That that in many ways you're you're making that that invisible part of the modern visible again. And I guess I wanted to ask you in a general way what's the importance of that history to your work, but also to think specifically about this kind of um, I don't know, this well-worn, you know, almost cliched um, post-war conversation about figuration and abstraction as these two, you know, these, these two binary oppositions, you know, that, that exist, um, you know, and, and also to think about the ways that that 
binary really fed into a kind of Cold War politics in which abstraction was, you know, you know, fetishized, instrumentalized during the Cold War is this example of the freedoms of liberal democracy, you know, and juxtaposed against these forms of realism that were much more popular in the decolonizing world. You know, it's so interesting because as you're talking about that, I started to think about Francis Bacon as, as the other pole to Picasso, right. let's say. Bacon is a queer guy, Bacon is dealing with language, Bacon is not someone who's just being expressive, which is how I think Bacon is put into art hist the art historical kind of canon. But as really kind of um, articulating violence in a very different way, and the violence and the condition of being. Um, and it's so interesting because you take from Bacon in that piece, Fragment of the Cru Crucifixion, where in this loop, or what would be now like a mem, and right, like something like that. This 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 human is somewhat caged or somewhat stuck in this in this in this um, space. And then it goes back to incarnator, where you see, I mean, where that's a very different form of atomization or fragmentation of a, of a crucifixion. But I don't know. I, I I just think thinking of Bacon again in that space, as opposed to Picasso as a different form of, you know, who is, who is so dismissed in that space um, is, is kind of interesting um, for, for me. And one, you know, and the kind of merging then of abstraction and figuration, this kind of space where since that is in the modern, especially in, 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 the, in the 60s and 70s, became such a, you know, you have this like deep Greenbergian kind of, disavowal of any form of representation and abstraction and that that was the only kind of pure space where something else could be possible and yet he was writing letters constantly with Frank Bowling talking about race and denying Frank Bowling's abstraction as 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 unassociated as that was so there was definitely this political agenda with that criticism and um, I just think like like it's and and these are the same critics that kind of undermined the history of Bacon, right? And and what Bacon could be, and why Picasso is held in this one regard and Bacon in this other. So that that's just a just, that's kind of an aside, but I think that we're dealing with this same like repeat bullshit right now in terms of in terms of in ter what is possible with an abstraction and what is possible in terms of representational work. And I don't think any student of art history or any, any artist can like tell me you can't see a Rembrandt and see abstraction in that, but be immensely moved by the humanity. And you know, The Jewish Bride, for example, one of the most beautiful paintings I think I've experienced, or, um, and feel kind of or Veronese, like from the from the middle of the from the from you know the Renaissance, Veronese, who had the slaves interacting with every single disciple at at the Last Supper, and was almost killed by the Pope for that painting. And what and you know and this is the most one of the most representational kind of political gestures. And there's immense levels of abstraction inside of there. So for me, this has been something that's been a part of art history and been a part of making a world making forever. And it's, and it's, it's, it's in an idea of holding some kind of hege hegemonic power that one wants to like carve this up into these various spaces. Um, but I also see that blending of that in, in your work because the, the erasure creates the abstraction where the one getting pummeled is getting pummeled by the ghost of the background. But, yeah, yeah. Also, to go back to this idea of the, the spectator being implicated oh, in yeah. that, and that then spectre this... of violence, you know, I think of like, you know, yeah. one of Bacon, you know, Bacon insisted that his paintings are only viewed behind glass. Because right. he wanted your reflection yeah. as part of the... And yes, they're exactly. so dark that if you go, you know, when you see them in the museum, like the thing that is like so striking... Is your shadow. After like looking your at reflection. the reproductions is like, there's this like cast that is impossible to avoid. You cannot possibly look at like a Bacon painting without seeing your reflection, Yeah. you know, embedded in that violence and that beauty that he's like showing. And I think, you know... We've but Lawrence, about Bacon. that's also the case with Rembrandt because of the varnish. Like it's you can't really look at those paintings right. without also trying to avoid the glare or your reflection. 
Just, just as a uh, yeah. yeah. No, no. But I mean, you know, I'm thinking of like Bacon as like a very clear, you know, reference of you know one of our yeah, one of our a- queer ancestors. Yeah. You know that I think is like present in like both of your work. I would, yeah, I, I, I think in a way, uh, my own attachment to just to kind of go back uh, and trying to piece together. Yeah, in some ways I feel like the, well, yeah, about figuration and abstraction. Um, to me, like, one of the benefits in a way of um, the, of the loop and of the kind of, the fact that all information is equally available online right now, it's like, Everything is a loop, uh, from Picasso to Bacon to like, you know, it's just all, uh, in a way, merged into the same status of availability in kind of the flood of images, um, is that you get the sense that these like things that historically have been presented as kind of fundamental ideological differences uh, you know, like there's the, the belief in kind of the ethics of abstraction as, you know, a rejection of like the illusions of figuration, but that in fact, at this point, you know, abstraction is just, is revealed to be as much of an illusion as, as figuration. Thank you. Um, in a way, every single thing is now equally a system, a kind of content, that can circulate in exactly the same ways. So in a way, it really, it overrides a lot of what we inherit as kind of like these fundamental ethical distinctions. Um, And we're attached to them as distinctions, and yet in so many ways, it's just clear what's, you know, what what overrides a certain kind of like received notion of ethics is the, the circulatability of everything as content. To, to, to the extent that it, like, it, it strains any notion of ethics. Um, well, but, but also, Paul, what's interesting about the space of abstraction and with whatever happens in that space is there, well, you're afforded a space of opacity, right? The space of like illegibility, the space of not necessarily being understood or having to explain oneself which I think is like essential to like mining a liberatory I mean, kind of. Yeah, I mean, to me the figurative version of a kind of like uh, opacity via abstraction would be something like uh, ventriloquism. Yeah. You know, I mean the figure appears and in a way so good. it's easy for the figure to appear. Uh, like I can af- appear as a figure who is Michael Jackson but with the voice of a Greek chorus. Can you, do, actually, can you talk about that more? Because you've high done school that students so much. In the Philippines. Yeah, high school students in the Philippines. <laughs> or, yeah, I mean, in a way, you know, what's revealed to me at this moment behaviorally is our attachment to the human voice as such. Um, there's this idea of like a one-to-one intimacy relationship of recognition like the reason why the figure is the figure is because I consider myself to be a figure. So mm. like you said about the Bacon paintings, mm. it's absolutely a mirror. Like that's how it's supposed to work. And what I love about Bacon is that he gives you a mirror where he shows you as the figure melting. <laughs> or, <laughs> like, or meat. Yeah, or turning into meat. Like Doja Cat. Um, <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, yeah, I just got it. Like, yeah, I saw the TikTok this morning. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I guess. Um, but but to speak of such things like opacity, like the re- the right to opacity. This is uh, uh, um, Glissant. 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 You know, like presenting this argument that you know, in the if you're if you're born and raised in a place that was uh, colonized before you were born, that in a way you're born into a system that is already surveilling you, 
from the very beginning and um, is controlling you um, in every way. And so there's like intellectually and creatively an argument to be made to aspire to a state of opacity where simply you exist as an agent in the field, visually and otherwise, in a way that is cannot fully be seen or apprehended. Mm. That's that's opacity. And uh, similarly, ventriloquism is like uh, I appear to be speaking, or this thing appears to be speaking, but it's clear that there's a gap between the perception of who's speaking and where the voice is actually coming from. So. Like, to me, these are relations of um, perception that are inherently com complicated or complex. Uh, I would oppose that. I don't know, this is just I me, mean, like, trying to think it through, and this came up when we did this discussion with, uh, about Pasita Abad in San Francisco a, a few weeks ago. Um, like, in some ways, uh, there's this kind of belief in American politics of uh, a politics of visibility, uh, which states that, you know, to become visible in society equates to agency. Um, you know, like to be oppressed is to be invisible, to become visible, to, you know, yeah, to become visible in society means that you've made it and you're now an equal citizen, you know, and you have agency as a citizen. Um, and, and so American politics of identity is a politics of visibility. To me, when you speak of opacity, or if I bring up ventriloquism, that to me is an excess of the politics of visibility. Because we're now talking about being purposefully invisible, mm. or to purposefully dissimulate a speaking voice from one entity to another. Um, these are forms of, you know, if I want to judge it, like deception. But more, less judgmentally, to, I would say, like, it speaks to an idea that I think is emerging, that uh, uh, a new expanded way to think about a politics of identity is like a politics of visuality mm. in which uh, visuality encompasses a much wider gamut of visual experience, including purposeful invisibility or camouflage as a form of like mimicking the surrounding background in order to hide from a predator, uh, like an insect, um, or to project one's voice from body to body in order to uh, create effects that are more than what they appear to be. Like this, in a way, defies a kind of conventional inherited notion of a kind of democratic politics of visibility in which to be an equal citizen in society, I must become visible. It's interesting though, Paul, also right now, that's also getting co-opted in social media. And we're seeing a lot of that currently with um, speeches, like shouts and protests deep being fakes. changed, deep fakes, yeah. Like, so you have, so it, even that kind of radical kind of possibility is also well, being co-opted to serve this other project. It's interesting just as an aside. Yeah, yeah, no, I would say, then I would bring in, I would bring us back to this, the, this space of unknowing yeah. that we have been talking about and in a way I would also call it a space of uncertainty. Like one of the things that we've been talking about is that one of the most basic inherited principles of politics and aesthetics has to do with certainty. You know, we like will debate each other until we become collectively certain or like achieve a consensus and then move forward from there. Um, and it's, it's a part of our, it's a fundamental part of our of political inheritance. Uh, less, but you know, to me, like social media is total uncertainty. Absolutely. Like as epitomized in the deep fake, like it's now clear we cannot trust 
anything that we see. Mm -hmm. The murmurings in so, the wilderness. To me, you know, to enter into a politics of visuality that includes camouflage and deep fakes and all other forms of visual and sensory simulation and dissimulation uh, is in a way to like begin to come to terms with living in a world that can no longer de be defined by inherited categories of certainty. You, you know, um, so just full transparency, this is like a segue into my last question. But, okay. Um, the, um, you know, thinking about, you know, that space of uncertainty that you're describing, and it's also, you know, thinking of some of those techniques like ventriloquism, this, are, this is how a ghost presents itself, right? That it's like this kind of like spectral haunting. It's not, it's not like, you know, like the ghost just appear, appears in front of you usually, but it's like makes itself known in other ways. And I, I guess I connect that with um, two things. One, you know, this, the idea of the loop and how like in those loops you can really, that, you're, that you've created, particularly prologue to the story um, of the birth of freedom, right? It's, it's this moment, this loop that allows those ghosts to emerge. And I think of, you know, that as a historian, the structure of that loop goes against everything that I've been trained to do. That I think, you know, unless you're really crazy, you know, like myself, the, the, you know, as a historian, you're really trained in this, like, dialectical understanding of history, right? Regardless of whether you're a Marxist or not, it's still, like, you know, at the base of it, that things change, that we've gone from, you know, um, a slave economy and slave society to, you know, um, feudal period in which, you know, indentured or serfs and then, you know, from that period to, um, you know, this kind of like moment of, um, you know, the emergence of the bourgeoisie to like the moment that we now, you know, inhabit this long kind of like um, bad news of like, you know, we, we live in the bourgeois period and the proletariat still, you know, attempts to assert itself, right? That in each of these periods, there's a dialectical conflict and one, you know, one protagonist in that conflict emerges victorious and gives us a new era, right? This is just like basic structure of history. But that, you know, this is something that we talked a lot about, you know, in 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic, this idea that like, wow, things really haven't changed, right? Like to suddenly like, you know, begin to question like, well, actually the conditions of our existence, you know, in many ways you can, you know, like in whatever isolated places we were, you know, we were in, I think we all began a kind of like ontological like questioning of like, have things really changed if like, you know, in the modern era we can't even like deploy like, you know, science to like resolve like what is clearly like you know a scientific problem a health issue so i think like bo both of your work really opens that up for me as well as the question of um audience right like so you know you, you were talking about this american politics of visibility you know that if you're if you're visible you're free Right, you've, you've, you've made it, you've, you've achieved like liberal democracy. Um, but you know, another part of that is like, if you're visible and living and here, you're free and what that formulation, you know, um, erases or rejects is, you know, the, the agency of our ancestors, the agency of the dead, as well as the agency of like, everyone that has yet to be born. And I think that there's a kind of ontology of the marketplace that says that the object was created to be appreciated, understood, and you know, val evaluated in the moment today, right? And that after that, it will just, you know, someone else can look at it. Without thinking of how actually many of the things that we do, certainly for me, the things that I write are, you know, the audience is not alive yet, right? Like yeah. the, the conditions of really fully understanding that will not emerge, if hopefully they ever emerge, until many, you know, decades, years, centuries in the future. But I was thinking of this in, in the context of two pieces um, in the show Incarnator and Sunset Flash. And I, 
you know, think of these as like, you know, related, like if, you know, you, I think of like the fabrication of the pieces in Incarnator, you know, like some of the, some of them were fabricated in the Philippines, some in Mexico and some in Spain. And it's not, you know, I mean, you talk about uncertainty and I'm sure there was this kind of improvised like decision-making that went into where the, these were produced. But, you know, that, that geographic, you know, scope mirrors like the colonial galleon trade between Spain, Mexico, and the Philippines. And I was thinking of that in the context, you know, and, and it's like, why would that even be in anyone's consciousness except for like, you know, like some Southeast Asian historian that's aware of like, you know, the, that historical relationship, right? That it's just like, well, how weird, like these three places that seem to have absolutely no relationship, like suddenly like, you know, they're in the same field. But I also thought of that in the context of um, Sunset Flash, which is, you know, as the didactics for the show point out, this really unusual kind of um, personal or, you know, like almost like a self-portrait that it's, you know, for me, it's also this refutation of this like, you know, that, that always annoying question of like, where are you from? Right? And the answer to that question is never, the person that's asking it is never going to be satisfied. Right? Like, yeah, but you don't really look like... So, you know, I, I think of these as like, you know, pointing to like those colonial networks that really inform our own being, right? Our own ontology and how, you know, this awareness of how those networks continue to inform how we move. And I think of also the ways that we have all really, you know, struggled to continue to circulate in the ways that our parents and their parents move through the world. You know, it's not, it's not easy, I can attest to this, to travel between like, you know, you know, any part of Asia in the United States and like to, to sustain that kind of like engagement with the places that we're supposedly from, you know, really requires like, that's real effort, you know, and, and like to continue to engage with that, those places, not as like just, you know, like some like fabled like return to like the homeland or something, but as like living, thriving, you know, parts of our, our lives. Mm. So, yeah, I was just curious, like, you know, how you... Yeah, wow. I, make sense of that. I love the question of, uh, right, that inevitable question of, like, where you're from, um, <laughs> like, what's your bio, <laughs> who are you? It's such a, in a way, like, humiliating question. Totally. Um, it's designed to make you like put yourself in a box yeah. and in a way it's necessary to be in a box to appear to others in some form uh, and I love that quote from the Roger Kyle Wah essay about uh, camouflage and insect behavior uh, it starts out because it's about you know how insects mimic the background to evade the predator uh, but it starts out with this amazing quote, be careful about uh, playing the ghost because you might become one. <laughs> um, uh, and sometimes it's cool to be a ghost and other times you, you really wanna be present in the room with other humans <laughs> to like have a say. So, um, yeah, I mean, all I can say is that like what you're describing in terms of, I mean, to invoke the ancestors is such a powerful thing to me. Or to invoke like a ghost from the future who's like haunting the present because it just inherently scrambles my brain in terms of time. Um, and in, in it, it, it goes beyond rational thought and like I've, I have, yeah, so, um, like I, 
have this idea that I want to share, which is just, you know, that in some ways, like, if you look at it objectively, you know, we all arrive uh, out of this kind of, like, traumatic moment of birth uh, without um, a choice in the matter. Uh, and what happens from there over however many years is a product of, is, is a process of, um, like, socialization or education to, you know, supposedly, I guess, ultimately become a fully formed adult human being. Um, and, you know, thinking of education as having an inherent relationship with colonialism, uh, this is one of the fundamental things I know about the Philippines is that, you know, uh, American education system that my parents and grandparents uh, were a product of and, and participants in um, was part of a colonial venture. Um, there's a lot of violence that goes on in the process, you know, in these processes of socialization and education. Um, and in a way, you know, the desire to become the agent, to become the protagonist, or to become the the, the fully formed functioning adult is, is such a desire that we almost have to repress the fact of where we came from, that well, that's original the trauma of, of just being born without <laughs> choice into the world. Like we literally forget about it. Probably until the moment of death when we suddenly remember it big time. <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah, so, I mean, I, I love the idea that in some ways, you know, like the real place we come from is and, and are going to, like our true identity is something almost like unspeakable um, because it's too much to, mm. to speak about such things. But, you know, in a way it's important to like, I mean, I, I like this idea that in a way, like one of the things we can do is prepare people who will be born in the future, who are gonna go through the same thing that we've gone through to like prepare them for that process. I think poetry does that. I think creating messages that are meant to function as intuitions that you both belong here and are who you think you are and at the same time, you totally don't belong here and you're not who you think you are. Like this intuition can be instilled in various material forms. and. These are messages that can be put in place so that future generations can find them and like have these intuitions. Or remember like, oh shit, people had this intuition before me. And we have that now of, of yeah. the past. Yeah. Great place to end. That was amazing. Yeah. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming. We're not Seriously. gonna do a kind of formal Q&A but um, because it's late, but we're glad to chat with any of you afterwards. <laughs>